Hello, everyone, and, and uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Steve Plach, and this is Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know, a Nonprofit Spotlight is the production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at Community Television. And uh, every program, we highlight an organization in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County doing wonderful, wonderful work. And we are really delighted this program to be featuring the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. And we're really happy to have the uh, Shelter General Manager, Amber Rowland. Amber, welcome. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is one of uh, everyone, really everyone's favorite organizations. So we're, as I said, delighted to have you here and find out as much as we can about what's going on with the animal shelter. But first, uh, for people who aren't familiar with you, uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to be general manager of the shelter. Okay. Um, well, probably not very many people are familiar with me. Um, I've only been in town since the end of March of this oh, year. Well, um, welcome. So <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, my husband and I moved here in March um, in order for me to take this position. Um, prior to coming to Santa Cruz, I li we lived in Austin, Texas, and we lived there for 21 years. Um, and prior to that, we lived in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, so yeah, we're new to the area. So I have the learning curve for me has been very steep, but it's also been very exciting and very fun um, to start getting familiar with Santa Cruz and all this beautiful area has to offer, um, as well as meeting lots of great new people and finding out about what all of the organizations do in the area and how we can, how the shelter can potentially tie in um, to help provide services to people of Santa Cruz County. So, um, so I've only been here a short time. Um, I do have a background in animal sheltering. So I worked in animal shelters for about 17 years prior oh, really? to, to hmm. coming to this position, um, both in Salt Lake City and in Austin, Texas. Um, and then I also have uh, a background in social work and in um, audit, audit and monitoring of all things. Um, so I had for the last seven years, I've actually been working for Austin Public Health in their monitoring division. Um, so that was a very, that was a career switch from working in the animal shelter for Austin, for the city of Austin. Um, then I moved to the health department and worked for the health department um, for the last seven years, including through the pandemic. Um, so yeah, so I have public health experience, social work experience, and then lots and lots of sheltering experience. So that's where I come from, um, and uh, I'm excited to you know get rolling here in Santa Cruz. Well, welcome again. It sounds like a wonderful combination of background skills, you know, to be able to uh, do what you're doing now. Uh, one thing before we kind of talk about uh, some of the operations of uh, the shelter and kind of what goes on, uh, you are characterized as an open door policy. Kind of tell you, tell us what that means in, in terms of your shelter. Yeah, so the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter has um, has been an open door shelter and we operate under what's called a socially conscious model of sheltering. So that is as opposed to um, sort of an animal impoundment facility. We're not just an animal impoundment facility, um, which some uh, some jurisdictions have uh, where they basically just take in animals and then if they don't get reclaimed, they may be offered for adoption. So some very under-resourced counties and communities have a shelter that's just an, sort of an impoundment facility and doesn't have much in the way of resources for having a real adoption program. Um, and so they have limited adoptions and unfortunately quite a few animals are euthanized in those shelters um, because they don't have the resources to be able to do much else with the animals. Um, thankfully, in this community, we have the resources to be able to have a robust adoption program. Um, and so when we take an animal in, our intent is generally to try to help them find a way out of the shelter um, alive. So that's what we work on. Um, however, we are also different from a lot of people talk about a no-kill animal shelter. Right. And we are not a no-kill animal shelter. Um, so the while we strive to have as many animals leave the shelter alive as possible, we know that in some instances we receive animals for whom the best and most humane option is a humane euthanasia. We also will provide euthanasia services for people who need it. If you can't afford to have your animal euthanized when they get old or when they get very sick or badly injured, um, people can bring their animals to the shelter and we will humanely euthanize the animal here at the shelter. So that's why we don't identify sort of as a no-kill shelter. So a no-kill shelter sounds like a nice thing. And um, we, you know, we do, again, we try to save as many animals as we reasonably can, um, but we don't want to claim that that name of no-kill because that I, I believe that misleads the public. 
And Santa Cruz County Animal Services has been an open door, socially conscious animal shelter for many years. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to come to this community was because it has a philosophy that I happen to agree with. I think that um, sometimes the most humane thing we can provide for an animal is a humane death. And, um, and so that's not something I shrink away from. And, um, and I believe that's part of our responsibility as caretakers and guardians of pets. And I know from experience, you do so much more there at the shelter. Uh, we can talk about your wonderful core of volunteers that you have, but I see them out. You know, you really care for the pets. You know, you make you, you make their life lives full while they're there. The outcome may not be as we would love it to be all the time, but nevertheless, they're thriving in transition. And I think that's just so wonderful. It's, that model is just terrific. So, so Amber, interestingly, uh, you have that uh, um, public health background and uh, in COVID and that kind of thing. Uh, but I know that uh, from what I'm understanding that uh, the operation of the shelter was really profoundly impacted uh, from pre-COVID to COVID to post-COVID. So uh, into what we call now the new normal. So tell us kind of how that transition was and, and how it affected the shelter and kind of where you are in terms of your operations. Yeah, um, so it's a little bit tough for me to speak of how, you know, how the shelter was doing prior to COVID, uh, sure. since I wasn't here and even during COVID. Um, but what I do know generally, some of the, and I'm, you know, we're working on some, still working through some of the impacts sure. um, that COVID has had on our shelter. And certainly there have been huge impacts nationally to shelters and communities and the economies all over the country. And anytime the economy is impacted, um, shelters are impacted because, you um, the, the welfare of pets is pretty directly related to the health and emotional and economic security of their owners. And um, so anytime that the economy gets knocked around, um, we tend to, shelters tend to see more animals coming in. Um, so when people, you know, when there are big layoffs, when there are, is a recession um, or when housing is hard to find or super expensive, we end up receiving more pets. And I think as everyone knows, we've seen the cost of living go up significantly just in recent years and the cost of materials and supplies and pet food um, and veterinary supplies, equipment, um, all of those expenses have gone up and that impacts uh, not only the shelter, but also owners out there in the community, people who have pets are being impacted by some of the economic effects of, of, the, of the COVID era and then the post-COVID era. Um, and so that automatically has some impacts on shelters. So what we have seen, I think the statistics are a little tricky. And again, the reasons that animal, animals come into the shelter are many and varied. They're as diverse as you could possibly imagine. They're as diverse as the animals that we receive. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, and, and maybe even more because it also reflects the diversity of their owners so or their, or their previous guardians. So um, we continue to see lots of animals coming in because people have lost their housing or their housing is unstable in some way, or they've gone through a, a major change in their life. Um, either, they're, you know, they've, either they've lost their job because of layoffs, because of a pending recession, or, um, or because an organization, and, and in some cases, people are giving up their pets because uh, they got a pet when they were working from home and now they're no longer working from home and it's harder for them to manage the care of a pet if they're not working from home. So um, we've definitely seen all of those things um, come into play, um, which isn't to say that we didn't see them before COVID um, or before the post-COVID era. So it, we've kind of seen more of the same, <laughs> if you will, um, just there are there seems to be a higher volume of animals altogether. And I'll tell you the reason that we think that is in the sheltering industry. Um, one, there has been a, there, nationally, there's a shortage of veterinarians and of registered veterinary technicians. So there is actually a shortage of uh, the workforce that does things like spay and neuter pets um, or provide them with vaccinations. And so that has led over the last several years to a decrease in the number of animals that are actually getting regular preventative veterinary care and animals that are getting spayed or neutered. And so that results in lots more accidental litters of puppies and kittens. Um, and it also can result in some outbreaks of disease or in animals getting sick because their people aren't getting vaccinations for their pets, either because they can't find a vet that can see them in a timely fashion or because they can't afford the care. Um, and so the shelter has, this shelter has seen an increase in the number of puppies and kittens that have come in, especially puppies. Um, and, and, and we think that's because for several years there during the pandemic, 
Um, veterinary clinics had to change their operations and people have had faced longer wait times to get veterinary services, including spay and neuter services, and they've potentially had to pay more for them um, because veterinary costs have gone up. And part of that is due to the scarcity of veterinarians and veterinary technicians. There's also been a lot of turnover in, the, in that particular career field. Um, there are a lot of, of veterinarians who are retiring and not necessarily new veterinarians who are stepping in to take their place. So in a lot of rural areas, there's less and less access to veterinary veterinary care. Um, and so that does have a direct result in the, in the fact that there, there are more animals out there in people's homes that are not spayed or neutered um, and potentially not vaccinated or, um, or microchipped. So that impacts the shelter because we see more sort of unwanted litters of pets. And then we may also see more pets that come in with illnesses or injuries because they can't get back to their owners quickly enough because they're not microchipped um, or they may be sick because they didn't get vaccinations. So it's it's all very complex. And um, and then we also, of course, the, the other big issue around here is housing and housing or lack thereof, housing that allows pets is has been scarce for a long time um, and it hasn't gotten much less scarce. So um, we do see a lot of intakes that has always been an issue uh, for shelters is seeing intakes because people can't find housing that will allow their particular type of pet. You know, I was not aware that uh, the shortage of uh, veterinary or veterinary technology skills uh, would impact, you know, the operation of shelter or the amount of, uh, of surrendered or adopted pets. And of certainly here, there's a confluence of the economy, which I don't consider robust by any means here in Santa Cruz, and our dearth of housing. We just simply don't have any housing. So yeah. that are the factors that really are affecting you. And, and I think it's a difficult to kind of, kind of juggle that. Um, one of the things that uh, we like to do here when we're talking to you uh, is do what, what we can to make sure you know, some, some funding comes in. So let us have your website so people, you know, when they're looking at this on, you know, when this goes into our playlist and this uh, show will be played many times during the year, it's what we call Evergreen. Let people know what the website is and how they can they can donate some money and prop some time. Yeah, so we there are actually several ways to donate to the shelter, oh. um, and one of them is just at our um, at our website, which is scanimalshelter.org. Um, and then we also have a great foundation that supports us, the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter Foundation, mm -hmm. um, and they have a website and they they fundraise on a regular basis and do all kinds of events uh, for and with us. Um, we try to have, we have events on a regular basis and people can always drop by and give us donations, um, either in-kind donations or, um, or, you know, monetary donations. Um, and we make great use of them. That's what I'll say. Um, okay. one of the, one of the specific funds that I think you, you mentioned earlier is our, is our, uh, extra mile fund. Okay. And that's through, that's through the foundation, the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter Foundation. Um, and the sec, the extra mile fund is, sort of specifically earmarked to provide extra care to animals who need some kind of extra care. And, um, and in many cases, those are animals that come into the shelter. So uh, the classic example is a dog, a stray dog gets hit by a car mm. and comes into our shelter and has a broken pelvis or a broken leg um, or you know significant injuries. So funds from the extra mile fund can help support that animal to get the additional veterinary care that it needs so that we can then provide it with the care, uh, get it out of pain, get it comfortable, do what we need to stabilize and fix the pet, um, and then spay or neuter the pet and make it available for adoption. Um, and potentially um, just assist if an owner comes forward, sometimes we'll have an animal that gets hit by a car or injured, comes in injured, and an owner will come forward, but they'll say, I, I don't have the money yeah, boy. to provide care to this animal. And then what do we do? And so in cases like those, the extra mile fund can actually step in and provide some of the funding to help get that animal the care that it needs so that the animal can then go back to its family. Um, because what we love to see more than anything else is for animals to go back to the families that care about them. Um, and we all know that accidents happen sometimes, animals get loose, um, bad stuff happens sometimes. Yeah. And, um, and we wanna be able to help people if they're in that position where they, uh, we don't want them to have to give up their pet because they can't quite pay for all of the veterinary costs that are gonna be involved 
um, to help save their animal or stabilize them. So, um, so the extra mile fund makes a huge difference to us. We have a wonderful cat named Wanda um, <laughs> that we just uh, just got adopted. Thankfully, it was great. Um, but she ha- she came in. She was having a complicated birth. And she ended up having partial paralysis in her back end because of, of this situation. But our doctors were able to work with one of our local veterinary clinics to provide her with the surgery that she needed. Um, and so she gained back function mostly. She's a little wobbly, um, but she, we were able to, to save Wanda and were able to make her available for adoption. Um, we had several cases recently um, and they were highlighted in the newsletter um, that the, the foundation sent out recently to donors. Um, so we've had several cases. We even had a rabbit who came in, who came up to the park and um, she had a broken leg and the, the leg had been broken for quite some time and probably the animal was injured and maybe let loose, let free for some reason because people couldn't afford veterinary care. But this rabbit sought help from somebody who was at the park and we were able to take that rabbit and have the leg amputated um, and then up offer her for adoption. So I believe she's in foster care now, um, but that's those are the kinds of cases that the extra mile fund helps with. Um, donations that come directly to the shelter um, and, and other donations that go to the foundation. Well, let's see. I'll try to stay on track here. So with the foundation, the foundation also has, um, through the foundation, we have a capital campaign going on. I was going to ask you about that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've kind of, we've kind of hit pause on the capital campaign for the moment. However, um, we are, we're working on developing a plan for what we would, what would best meet the community's needs as far as what kind of capital improvements we can make at the shelter. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that, that capital campaign is still there and it's still active and it's still specifically for capital improvements for the shelter facility. Um, and so we hope that some folks will continue to want to give to that. Um, and we're working on redeveloping a plan for how we want to, um, to use that funding. Um, but we, but we really want to take into account, you know, the, the, the most recent plan that we had um, for the capital campaign, for this next phase of the capital campaign. We've we already completed one phase of the capital campaign. We've expanded the shelter. So we have a great new room in the front of our shelter and a, um, a catio um, that we use as a group room, which is a great setting for people to meet cats that are available for adoption. Um, and we've also expanded our surgery suite so that we have space to do more spay neuter surgeries um, and also do additional surgeries. I believe tomorrow we have an amputation on a large dog that's scheduled right here in our shelter. Um, and our our enlarged surgery suite has allowed us to, to do things like that. But there is another phase of the capital campaign, and that was imagined uh, several years before COVID hit. Oh. And what we're trying to do now is, tr- is start to assess whether that plan still makes sense or whether we need to make some adjustments to what we envision um, for that for that for our next phase of capital improvements. Um, there are always ongoing maintenance needs at the shelter. Um, it's a it's a highly used facility. There's a lot of high use activity that happens, um, and you know cleaning with chemicals every day means that finishes don't last as long as they might in a regular home setting and that kind of thing. So, so there are always upkeep things that donations can help a a, a lot with. Um, you know new fencing for our play yards. Um, we want to put a at a uh, shade and weather cover at our shelter, our Watsonville shelter location, um, to make it a little better for staff and, and clients who are coming and going from the shelter. Um, so there are lots of projects that we have on our list that we're constantly trying to ch- tick through and, uh, donations can help a lot with that kind of thing. Um, for donations that come directly to the shelter, that goes, most of those funds go toward paying for spay neuter surgeries. Um, we, we do have um, a couple of vets that work here at the shelter. They're not, um, we have one part-time veterinarian on staff. And that is actually, that goes back to your question about how COVID impacted the shelter itself. Um, we used to have a veterinarian on staff, a full-time vet on staff. Um, we had a vet retire and then the shelter was unable to find another vet to take her place. And so for two years, the shelter operated completely with veterinarians via contracted services, um, which works okay, um, but it's not ideal. And um, so that is one way that the, that the pandemic and the veterinary shortage kind of came together and impacted this shelter pretty, pretty heavily um, because contracted veterinary services cost a little bit more um, for the shelter. So um, so we're working on that issue as well and are hoping to, to hire to get another 
uh, vet on staff, um, but we may not be able to have that be a full-time vet. It may just be a three quarters time position. Um, but our, so our donation funds can help um, with just our basic spay neuter services and also will help us um, to start to rebuild the community outreach programs that we had prior to the pandemic. So during the pandemic, we had to shrink a little bit. We had to pull back out of the community a little bit. Um, and, and also, and again, because of that veterinary and, and um, veterinary technician shortage, we had to pull back some of our outreach efforts and we would like to be able to expand those again, but costs have now gone up um, both for the staffing and for the supplies needed for that kind of thing. So costs of vaccinations have gone up significantly in the last couple of years. Um, the supplies to administer vaccinations, the gas to get to different locations to have outreach events have, has gone up. So all of those things impact our operations and um, donations to the shelter help us to, um, you know, we, we are partly funded by the county and the other jurisdictions that we serve in the county of Santa Cruz, um, but that doesn't cover all of our needs and definitely doesn't cover the, the extra stuff that we like to be able to do to help the animals stay sane and safe and happy in our shelter while they're here. Yeah, that's wonderful information. And uh, the Santa Cruz really is such a, a generous community. So we urge people that are watching this to consider making a donation uh, and then especially the extra fund, uh, extra care fund, the extra mile fund. Uh, I That's such a common story with people that I know who are of modest means, who's, who's, uh, whose animal, whose friend, you know, whose support, you know, animal perhaps has some problem that they just can't afford to deal with. It's just beyond their means. And, and right. so they have to kind of relinquish that, that support that they have because economically they can't do that. So it's such a wonderful idea. Yeah, and that's that's why some of our outreach services I feel are so key, and we really want to try to get back out there um, with our. You know, we we had a program, um, and now it's now it's slipping my mind. I can't remember the name yeah, of it. Sorry, sorry, we have a sorry. There's one of them is a one stop program. Okay. In which, uh, folks could come into the shelter and get a microchip and a rabies vaccination at a very low cost. Um, we have not been able to do that the last couple of years, and I would like to get that running again, up and running again. Um, because again, I, I, you know, you touched on it a little bit, um, and my, my background in public health and yes. in social services, I definitely understand the, the incredible, the incredible bond that people develop with their pets and how important pets can be for people's mental health. And, you know, it's been all over the news that mental health, we're kind of in a mental health crisis in this country right now, and pets can help with that. So, um, <sighs> It, but it's tricky when they become too expensive to have. Um, and so that's why we want to be able to, to, to get back to a point where we can help support people who are modest and low income um, it, to allow them to keep their pets because pets are such an important part of overall health um, for people, we believe. Um, and we want people to be able to have their pets and to be able to manage them well and to be able to keep them safe and provide for them um, in a way that makes them feel good as well. So, um, because caring for another another being is, um, it's inherently good for your mental health. Well, it's really uh, wonderful information. And we're unfortunately down to about five minutes or so in our interview, we could go on for another hour or so at <laughs> least. But one thing that I uh, noticed, one thing that really impressed me about uh, the animal shelter was you know the, the care that you give the animals who are there and you have volunteers who come in and work with the animals and 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 give them the care and love and compassion if they need um how is the COVID affected that are you able to kind of you know get it back to, to a robust volunteers you know group and yes yeah we did have to sort of scale back our volunteer operations as i understand it during the pandemic but we are back up to full steam and we can absolutely use more volunteers anytime um we have um we we uh, megan is our volunteer coordinator and there are links in our at our website where people there people can sort of sign and up the website again is yes that is scanimalshelter.org um, and so yeah we have volunteer orientations uh regularly um and and volunteer training uh, we have a diversity of animals to care for yeah. and we also have a diversity of tasks that volunteers can do so 
if volunteers just want to kind of come in and do something zen that really helps animals, helping us with laundry and helping us wash dishes, believe it or not, is incredibly helpful um, and allows our staff to be engaged in some higher level tasks. Um, and so that's an incredibly important volunteer position. Greeting customers at the door and helping them find their way around is incredibly, in incredibly helpful. And then we also have the direct care sort of tasks for volunteers, like walking our shelter dogs, um, interacting with and grooming our shelter care cats and rabbits and guinea pigs um, and helping to clean the cages and enclosures that those animals are in. Um, that's incredibly important. Our, sh our shelter always operates on kind of a shoestring of staffing. And so, um, for, yeah, so any anytime we can get volunteers in that can help with any elements of the care that we provide the animals or to the clients who come to visit us, um, it's super helpful. Volunteers are, yeah, they are, I worship the ground they walk on because they uh, <laughs> they do amazing things for us um, and really make the difference for the animals that are in our care and as well as for the visitors that come to the shelter. You know, it's uh, an interesting thing about uh, the animal shelter is that it really reflects our community values, you know, how caring and compassionate we are as people and with our, you know, residents that we're, that we're coexisting with, not only for shelter, but just the animals that are around that, that give so much love and, you know, and so much support. I know you're caught up in the moment. You just got here in March, but are you thinking about uh, the present and how you're going to move into the future and kind of what animal services, animal shelter services are going to look like as we move forward? Well, I would, a couple of things that have been on my mind is, um, again, I would love to see our volunteer core expand and our fostering program to expand um, so that we can provide care for more animals, even outside of our shelter walls. Um, and so expanding our volunteer program or our fostering program um, could be really helpful and could allow us to help some pets that, that previously we haven't been able to help as much. Um, so animals that have, you know, significant ongoing medical care needs, right. maybe yeah. you're in a foster home. Um, and, and even, you know, there's even the potential to have um, fosters for animals who are near the end of life, but they're not quite at that point where humane euthanasia is the best option. I never really thought about that. Yeah. yeah, hospice fosters may be something. Oh my. Um, and there are, you know, it takes a special kind of foster to do that, but, um, but it can be a, a very rewarding um, activity for a lot of people. So I think the idea of of ensuring that our shelter is sort of uh, seen as a resource around the community for concepts of truly humane education. Like the idea that kindness, we want kindness and compassion to be universal. Um, we, it's, it's very easy to adore an adorable little puppy or kitten or baby bunny face, right? Um, it's, it's super easy. Um, it's a little bit harder when there are you know, when it's people and especially when people disagree with us, but can we, can we, use animals um, and their openness and what they do to our hearts <laughs> to open us up, can we tap, help tap into that to help people find that in every interaction that they have with any other person? Um, you know, can we bring kindness and compassion that we show towards needy animals to everybody and, and see what that does out in the world? <laughs> well, we certainly hope so. And again, uh, Amber Rowland, uh, shelter manager for the Santa Cruz uh, County Animal Shelter, thank you so much again. Welcome to the community. Thank, thank you for so your great work. Uh, this um, is, is, is near and dear to, to every heart uh, in Santa Cruz. So those people who want to donate, who want to volunteer, they should go to your website and do so. But again, thank you so much for this great work. Thanks for sharing some time and your thoughts and your heart with us today. And we hope to be talking to you again very soon. So Amber, thank you so much. I think Steve Plage. This has been another uh, episode of Nonprofit Spotlights. Join us next time when we look at another wonderful organization in Santa Cruz County.